right, let's uh, let's begin. Everybody have a good time on your free time. Are you all going to fall asleep? Take a nap. After the class, huh? yeah, right. If you do fall asleep in class, you have my sympathies because uh, the reason, one of the reasons I became a pastor was because I kept falling asleep in church. And so I figured if I preached on Sunday that I could stay awake on, in church. So. No, that's a true story. I, I just wish I could communicate with guys that I am totally listening with my No, I, I agree, I agree. I, 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 I can fall, as, I fall asleep almost any place. I once fell asleep standing up. So, uh, <laughs> it was a, so, well, let's, let's pray and let's get started. Father, thank you again for uh, the rain and the sunshine and all the good things you give to us. Thank you for this time together. We ask your blessing upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we looked at theism. That kind of gives us a worldview of where we're coming from. Obviously, we believe in a God who is separate from this world, and that's the God we're going to be looking at in our study of theology. So here's the question. The discussion question we'll begin with today. Can we know God, and how can we know God? Now, since I know most of you are Christians, at least it seems that way, and from what Rick said, you come, many of you come from Christian families and homeschooled, things like that, so I don't want just the biblical answer here, okay? Try to think if you're not a Christian and somebody comes up to you, some Christian comes up to you and says, hey, do you know God? And your first question is, well, can we know God? So how do we how do we know God? Okay, spending time with Him. So obviously, when we ask that question, we're assuming that God exists. Okay, so we assume that God exists. So maybe a, a, a earlier question is: Does God want to be known? Why do you say that? Okay, from a, from a biblical and scriptural perspective, that's, that's obvious. But is there anything in this world that might show that and say that? Could you go to a, somebody who has no background in Christianity and say to them, uh, you know, God, God wants to be known by you, and God wants to know you? Creation. Okay, can you elaborate a little? Okay, so how, how many times have you gone to the beach, it's a beautiful sunset, and you're just watching it, and you're saying, wow, this is so great, isn't God wonderful? Right? Yeah, every time. I was, I was um, what was I watching? Some, some show, and they were talking about, and it wasn't, it wasn't a Christian show, but they were talking about eternal life, e eternity. Oh, it's, it's a show my wife watches, Ghosts. You probably don't watch TV here, so, but it's, it's, it's about these ghosts that are in this house, and this one, uh, the wife of this couple, they, she's the only one who could see them. And so they're talking about eternity and stuff like that, and some, somebody makes the comment, you know, that there's only so many sunsets you can watch. And I disagree with that. I mean, have you ever looked at a sunset and said, oh, this is boring, let's move on? Okay, no, because why? Each sunset is different, right? Have you, uh, you probably don't remember this commercial because it was a number of years ago where you see a father and a son, they're sitting and they're watching the sunset. And just when the sun finally gets down uh, below the horizon, uh, the, the little boy goes, Dad, can you do it again? And, th and that's what a sunset does. So that's what nature does. That's what creation does. It causes us to think beyond ourselves. So that, that's one way. Any other ways? Okay, so it's, it's kind of a multi-question, and, and maybe I'll ask it a little differently. How, how can we know God? 
So we, we've kind of asked the question, does God want us to know him? Does he want to know us? We've kind of said yes. So how, how do we know God? Go ahead. By reading his word. Okay, by reading his word. That's, that's what we Christians will, will say right away, okay? Okay, spending time in prayer. What, what other ways does God reveal himself to us? So now we're talking about, this is the theological word, revelation. Think of it this way, and this is a corny illustration, but it might work for some of you. Let's say you're, you're outside and you're just kind of walking around, you see this ant pile, and you look down at these ants and you start watching them and you kind of say, you know, there's, there's a better place for them to have their home over here. And you decide, how am I going to communicate to these ants? What's the best way that I can get these ants to move over here? So some of you would say, well, I just pick up all the ants or take a shovel and dig up the ant hill and put it over there. That's one way. But the other way is, Bread. what's that? Breadcrumbs, okay, you could, you could kind of lead them, all right? But from a Christian perspective, what about becoming an ant and telling them what to do? <laughs> well, isn't that what God did? Okay, so when we even look in the Bible, how, how did God reveal himself to people? What are some ways that he revealed himself? So we've already talked about nature. We've talked about scripture. Okay. Miracles. Okay, miracles. So the things that God does, God's works. So God's works, we can say all his works are miracles, or we can even say the fact that he set up certain laws of science, set those up, could that point us to a designer, somebody who is in control, See, so, so there you go, his works, his miracles. I heard somebody say, Jesus Christ. Okay, that's, in a sense, the ultimate revelation of God. What other ways? Can you think of any ways the Bible tells us how God reveals himself to us? Romans 2, anybody think of what's in Romans 2? Or even Romans 1 and 2? What's that? Um, that's Romans, Romans uh, 3 or 6. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Creation. Okay, we already said creation. What's that? Okay, that's not in Romans 2, but that's another way. Um, for instance, if I were to, let's go back to that illustration. Let's say you're a total heathen, never been to church, never heard the Bible. Someone comes up to you and says, do you want to know God? And you say, well, how do I know him? And... That person then says, well, let me tell you about how I know God. So by somebody sharing their experiences, we might be able to know God. What other way? Okay, your, your conscience. That's what Romans 1 and 2 talks about. It tells about how in our conscience, God has given us this sense of who he is. So this is why most people have a sense of right and wrong. It may be messed up, <laughs> it may be very subjective, but we all have this sense of some things are right, some things are wrong, some things are good, some things are bad. Some things are beautiful, some things are not as beautiful. And all those things we could say, well, it's all subjective. Is it? Is it really? Now, the good and evil, we might say, well, probably not, but things like beauty, we tend to think is totally subjective, but is it? Are there certain things that cause us, the most of us, to say that's beautiful? We talked about a sunset. Most people would say a, a sunset is beautiful, see? So there, there's this sense that we have that, where did we get this idea that that's beautiful? You know, why isn't, you know, a picture that's black and black on black, what if someone says that's beautiful? Those are the times you kind of go, okay. And that's when you, that's when you think, that what's that? God made us that way. Yeah, 
I, I think, I believe so, so that God will reveal himself in that way. So this is what we talk about revelation. So if you have your, your outline here, that's the first subject here is revelation. Why do we need a Bible? Why do we need something to tell us about God? Because we cannot find God on our own. Because God is creator, we're creation. Because he is perfect holiness and we are the opposite. We might think we can find God on our own. But even the Bible says we can't find God on our own. Now the Bible does say if you search with all your heart, you will find me. But the Bible is also clear that our search for him begins with his grace already in our lives. So, we need God to reveal himself to us. It's not just that we can go out and search for God and we can find him. God reveals himself to us. And he reveals himself to us in many different ways. Can you think of other ways, maybe more in the Old Testament? How did God reveal himself to other people? We talked about creation, we talked about conscience, we talked about the Bible. Okay, um, things in nature, miracles, okay? A literal cloud. Okay, literal cloud. Prophets. Prophets, dreams, visions. So there are many ways that God can reveal himself to us. This is a study of bibliology, which is a study of the Bible. What does the Bible say about God? What is the, what is the purpose of the Bible? How did we get the Bible? and things like that. So, first of all, Revelation, uh, in your outline there are a number of scriptures here you could look on your own. Psalm 19 talks about um, how in the heavens we see God. Um, Romans chapter 1, 18 through 21 also talks about nature as a place where, we, where God reveals himself. John chapter 1, 18 talks about Jesus Christ being a special revelation and Hebrews 1 and 2 talks about how God revealed himself, first of all, in the prophets, but now has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. When we talk about revelation, there is what's called general revelation, and there's special revelation. General revelation is the revelation God gives to everybody equally, so that when we go out and see a sunset, it's all equal. We all look at the same sunset. We may view it a little differently. We may have different responses from it. And for a believer, they're going to say, wow, isn't God wonderful? And look at his creation. An unbeliever says, wow, isn't nature great? Or something like that. I don't know what they say. But the, but the point is, the revelation is the same for everybody. That's what's called by general revelation. Special revelation is just what the word means. It's special. It's specific. So scripture is special revelation. Jesus Christ is special revelation. When, if and when God would come to you in a dream or a vision, that would be special revelation. And because he came to you in a dream or a vision, it's very special for you, probably not for anybody else, unless God said, this is what I'm going to tell you, and now you need to tell it to everybody else. Then... It becomes a prophecy or something like that, or a word of knowledge, or however you want to give those terms. But the idea is that God has a general revelation for everybody. And Romans chapter 1 says that general revelation, there's enough of the knowledge of God in that to bring condemnation. The wrath of God is seen in the nature around us and in the conscience he gives us so that we are without excuse before God. But general revelation does not give us enough information to know what to do about it or to be saved. So general revelation, God basically says, I exist and you are accountable to me. And so that's not a very pleasant bit of information, really, if you understand that God is holy. But it's the special revelation through Jesus Christ, through scriptures, that tells us the remedy that we can have and that we can have a relationship with him. So, you understand what revelation is? Revelation is God declaring himself, speaking himself to mankind. Okay, question. So, for general revelation, like, oftentimes people ask the question of, uh, like, how do, the, how do 
know someone who like lives on an island who's never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ mm-hmm. before, you know, have an opportunity to be saved. And they have a lot of times people say, Oh, the general revelation is like how they get saved. But I mean, I think it is pretty accurate to say that it only points to the existence of a God, not which God. Yeah. Well, here's, here's how I've always explained it, that, that as we respond to general revelation in faith and trust, so that you, you look at a sunset and you say, wow, there has to be something beyond this world. There's something that created all this. I want to know that something. I want to know that somebody. And that person may even cry out, if you're alive, if you're out there, help me to know you. And I believe that the more we respond to any kind of general revelation that God gives us, he begins to give us special revelation, specific revelation. So that, yes, general revelation does not save you, but I think responding to general revelation, in a sense, opens up your heart and your life to greater revelation from God. One of my professors in seminary kind of explained it this way. Think of, um, think of the, the knowledge of God as, as a huge uh, loose-leaf notebook, you know, the kind of notebook that you, you opened up and put your papers and had three, three holes in it. So you've got this notebook, and you, you open it up, and you read it, and you understand about God. All of a sudden, you see on, on the table in front of you, there's a, there's a page, page with three holes in it. You kind of look at it, and you say, I think this belongs in my notebook. And if you have a sense of trust and confidence, you're going to say, yes, it does, and you put it in your notebook. So in other words, God, God is, is a love, I believe, is a loving God. And so when you re, so that, that native on that island that's never heard the gospel or doesn't have scripture, as he responds to what God shows him in nature, God will begin to show him more and more. I don't know if when you had Chris Cook speak here, did he tell you about the story of how Christianity came to Hawaii and how the, the kahuna, and maybe I got this story wrong, so <laughs> bear with me and you can correct me if that's not what he said, how, how the kahuna had basically prophesied that God would come to them in a box, which, which sounds really silly to us, okay? So did Chris not tell you this, this story? Okay, so when Captain Cook came, one of the gifts they gave to the, the king was a box that had a Bible in it. And they opened the Bible, they began to read it, and that same kahuna basically said, you need to listen to this. Now, he did not trust in it, he did not believe, but he said, this is from God. So the idea is that here, spe- the, the general revelation is there, and God brings greater revelation. So I I believe that's what happens. I can't prove that from scripture necessarily, but I I believe it uh, theologically and logically that God is a God of love, and as we respond to him, he he gives us more and more of himself. Okay, any other questions on revelation? Okay, from revelation we go to number two, inspiration. Inspiration answers the question, who wrote the Bible? So 2 Timothy 3.16 says all scripture is inspired, God breathed. So God is the author of scripture. And then 2 Peter chapter 1, it talks about how the spirit of God moved on the minds of the authors of scripture to write down what God wanted them to write down. So scripture, you have dual authorship if you want to call it that way. God is the author of scripture, but he used humans in order to write it. Okay? So, you could say, well, God's the author of scripture, but he did use humans. And that's why when you look at the different books of the Bible, they're different from each other. The way Paul wrote is different from how Luke wrote. The way... Paul wrote is different how David wrote in the Psalms. So the personalities of the human authors comes out in their writings, but ultimately uh, God is the author of Scripture. So inspiration talks about who wrote Scripture. 
God is the author of Scripture. He used um, human authors to do that. And if you look in First or Second Peter, it talks about how they were born along by the Holy Spirit. Now, our Scriptures were not dictated to these authors. Some people believe that, that Moses... Now, there's portions of Scripture that were dictated, but for the most part, that's not how God... Uh, had his scripture written down. He moved in the minds and the hearts of the authors. He didn't say to them, write these words, put these exact words down. But it does bring up the question. The words that ended up being written down, what can we say about those words? So that's the next category. Look at that. Infallibility, inerrancy. Is the Bible trustworthy is it free of error? So, of course, 2 Timothy 3.16, as I said before, says that God breathed out scriptures. So if God is true, then don't you think his scriptures would be true? And 2 Peter chapter 1, 19 through 21, again, men were born along so that, God, uh, so that what God wanted written was actually written down. And then Matthew chapter 5.18, Jesus himself says, that not one, and literally it's not one jot or tittle, will disappear from scriptures until all is fulfilled. Now, if you know the Hebrew language, uh, a jot is this little piece of a letter. It's not even a full letter, just this tiny little thing. A tittle is, 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 is like an apostrophe. Now, if, if, if Jesus were to be that specific, don't you think... The Bible, the written word of God, is both trustworthy and free of error. Now, this word inerrancy is a problematic word for many people, partly because it has been used, remember the, 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 the circles of essential and non-essential beliefs we looked at? Some have put inerrancy in the place of what is essential. And others have said, no, inerrancy is not essential. Inerrancy goes, for some people, goes so far as to say that everything in Scripture is truthful so that when um, the authors talk about facts that may relate to science, they're truthful. And so that's why you'll have many people say, well, the only way you can understand Creation is a literal 24 hour, six days, 24 hours, because that's what the words say. But we need to realize that all literature has different, in, se in a sense, degrees of factuality and truthfulness. So that sometimes what's being written or what's being said is a figure of speech. It's a description. It's meant to cover something that's broader than just something that's real specific. So for instance, if you were to ask me, what is my birthday? And I would say to you, my birthday is February. That would be a correct statement. My birthday is in the month of February. But if I said my birthday is February 28th, that's a true statement. Does that make my first statement, when you said my birthday and I just said February, does that make that false? No, it's a, you can see how it's a different degree of truthfulness. And so, to me, when you approach scripture, you have to realize that it is a book that is a literature book. And so sometimes you have to say, well, is this is this a figurative figure of speech? Is this a metaphor? Is this a simile? Is this an illustration? Is this meant to um, just look at one part of something, but it leaves out another part? And of course, you, you come to that as you study God's word, as you compare it with other parts of the Bible and things like that. Um, earlier, we talked about the differences of, of views on the book of Revelation and on the end times. Well, this is one of the reasons. Are all the things in the Revelation 
Are they to be taken literal or not? Are we supposed to look at all these beasts and say they're literal beasts? Most of us say no. But then you say, okay, then what do they represent? And that's where all the differences come in. But some would say, no, it's, it's, it's got to be literal. And so many believe, there's actually paintings, you know, it talks about Jesus when he comes, he has a sword in his mouth. And there's actually a painting where he's, he's coming on a horse and he's got a sword coming out of his mouth. Do you think that's what John meant? I don't think so. I think it's saying it's his words that have the power. And so it's not, I don't believe Jesus is necessarily going to come with this military might as much as with the power of his word. He doesn't need swords to defeat his enemies. He just needs his word. So that's, that's, that's it's showing the power of his word. So, so that, that's, I like to say when you, when you read the Bible, try to interpret the Bible um, plainly. Take it at face value, but understand that it's a piece of literature, and therefore you, you have to ask yourself, is this, is this figurative or is it not? But that's where this whole inerrancy comes in. Some people believe that all scientific facts, or for instance, you can read in, in Kings, where it says that David had 12,000 men during this one battle, and then in Chronicles it says David had 13,000 men. And so some people will say, see, there's an error in scripture. I was improv, something like that. Okay, yeah, there, you can, you, I think every one of us can find that. And, and, or, or even when you, you try to match up uh, the gospel recordings of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, try to match up every single event from all four gospels and try to put it in some kind of timeline. You can't do it in a very logical way. So then you have to start thinking. For instance, I think one of them says there were two angels there. One says one angel. Does that mean one is wrong? Not necessarily. Because maybe the one who said there was one angel is specifying just one of those angels, but there were actually two. See? Or maybe the person that they got the story from only noticed one angel. It doesn't necessarily mean that one account is false and one is not. And that's the thing to do. And that's why I say when you come to theology, when you come to scripture, you have to come with a kind of sense of belief. You have to say, look, I believe this to be the word of God. So when I run across something that seems to contradict something else in scripture, I'm not going to right away jump to the conclusion, well, this is wrong. The Bible is wrong. I'm going to say, hmm, that's interesting. If I have time, I'm going to explore it more. Otherwise, eh, I'm going to ask my pastor what the answer is, or something like that. The point I'm saying is you, you got to approach it with some kind of faith and some kind of sense that, okay, I'm going to believe this and, and then go from there, kind of. And, and when you hear of other people criticizing Scripture and saying, oh, you can't believe the Bible because it has all these, um, these errors in it and stuff like that, ask them, well, what error? Because they're probably repeating somebody else when it comes to that. So just be aware of that. This is what we talk about when we talk about infallibility and inerrancy. Infallibility talks about the, uh, the trustworthiness of Scripture. Inerrancy talks about the fact that it has no errors in it. Okay, number four, canonicity. Canonicity is how we got the books of the Bible. Did you ever wonder why there are 66 books and not more or less? And why the Roman Catholic Church and some other denominations have more than 66 books? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever heard of the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Philip? How come they're not in Scripture? Anybody ever read the Gospel of Thomas? Well, you ought to read it sometime. And, the, and here's the question to ask yourself. Compare the Gospel of Thomas to the other Gospels and you'll have your answer why it's not in the Bible, okay? It's not that hard. It's very different from the other Gospels. But there are all these other books back then, and many have said, why aren't these in there? Therefore, you can't really trust the Bible. You know, what do they say? It's the winners who write history. So it's the winners who wrote down and put in the books of the Bible that we have. 
All those other people who were branded as heretics, none of their works got into the Bible. But maybe there's some truth to theirs. Well, as I said, read them and you'll see a real difference among them. Okay, comment, question. So, what about some of the books of the Bible that are referenced in the Bible? Yeah. That we may not uh, have in there anymore? Like? Like Jasher. Okay, and y you're right. And, and in the Old Testament, they talk about the chronicles of the kings and things like that. Um, I think that would be the same way as if I were to preach and I said... Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said this. That doesn't make it scripture, though. I may use it to defend what I'm saying or to illustrate a biblical principle, but it doesn't make it scripture. Uh, same way with, with Paul. I think he actually quotes from um, secular poets. You know, so so he's, he's not above using literature that's outside of scripture to defend his case. Now, what, what the other part is, for instance, um, you know, Peter makes the comment about scripture and he says how scripture is God's word. And he says even the things that, and he attributed Paul's writings to be scripture, even though he said some of it's hard to understand. So even by the time of Peter, there was already this understanding that certain ones of these books and these letters were to be looked at as scripture coming from God. But, so. I mean, they didn't decide like on the 66 books until like the King James, right? Yes. Well, no, no, it was much earlier before the King James, but, but it was, it was, it, it was a council of bishops that, that in, in a sense came up with the final, what, what we know as the Bible today. And in order to do that, they excluded some, and they included some that probably others, like Martin, like, uh, Martin Luther uh, said that, that the book of James was a straw epistle, meaning he didn't like it. Well, why didn't he like it? Because you can read it, and you can think that he's promoting salvation by works. And of course, Martin Luther was so adamant, no, salvation is not by works, it's by grace through faith. And so that's why he would look at James. But in saying that, he did not take it out of his Bible. That was Jefferson. And anybody know about the Jefferson Bible? <laughs> Thomas Jefferson? What he did was he went through the Bible, and all the parts he didn't like, he just tore out. And he, then he published his Bible. Wow. Yeah. So, but, okay, but go ahead. Do you have more? Yeah, from Greek to English, yeah. yeah he translated like 80 books. And even like the Great Bible, which was before the King James, had more than 66. So, I don't know, like, what made those invalid when they were doing Okay, yeah, when it comes to canonicity, which is what, what books of the Bible should be in there, um, the criteria they used was, first of all, the connection to an apostle. So when you look at that, well, Matthew was an apostle. Mark was not an apostle, but he was closely connected to Peter. Many believe that Mark's gospel is really Peter's gospel, just written by Mark. Uh, you have Luke, who was not an apostle again, but he hung around with Paul. He, he says from the very beginning, he researched all this by talking to the original eyewitnesses. And then um, John, of course, was an apostle. Paul was not one of the original 12, but many believe, well, he was an apostle. He was considered an apostle. So he's in there. So then you have, um, uh, of course, Peter was an apostle. So you have First and Second Peter. Uh, John, many believe that the apostle John wrote the epistles and that he wrote Revelation. Uh, the only other one is the book of Hebrews. That's the one we don't, one, we don't know exactly who the author is. We don't know if there's a connection to an apostle. But when you read the book, you, you can see the real close connection to uh, a Hebrew kind of Christianity and, and kind of showing how the transition has been from, from the Jewish faith to the Christian faith and how all these things were, 
were, were images of what would happen to show us and point us to Jesus Christ. And so some people would, would say, how, did, how in the world did Hebrews get into the Bible? So that was one thing, is that there was a connection to the author. And then second criteria was internal evidence. As you read, the, as you read these books, are there things in that book that contradict what other scriptures say or what other historical things about Jesus Christ say? So, uh, and, and this is true of any kind of book that you're trying to figure out, is this true or not? If you, if you were digging in, in my backyard, <laughs> Uh, which, which would be kind of fun, uh, and you came across some book, and you looked at it, and it looked really ancient, and you came up, hey, did you know what this book is? And I said, no, this must have been buried way before we ever moved here. And, you know, it's, it's got Hawaiian in there and all this kind of stuff, and you kind of say, is this authentic? Well, how, how in the world would they, dis would, would they go about finding out if it's authentic or not? Yeah, they would compare it to other books of that time. They would look at the, the paper it's made of and all kinds of things. You have, you know, you, you've got movies uh, about all this kind of stuff, how you, how you research this kind of stuff. So that, that's what they would do. So there has to be a, a, a kind of an internal consistency to each of these books. So that was a criteria that they used to whether that became scripture or not. And then it was the verdict of the church. And when I say the verdict, it wasn't like uh, these bishops got together at this council and they said, okay, we're going to take a vote. Who votes for Matthew to be in the scriptures? No, it was already a recognition that certain books were already scripture. It was this committee, in a sense, that validated all of that. It wasn't that they were making the choice to do this. But at the same time, it was the, the church that was making this decision. This is one of the... The criticisms the Roman Catholic Church has against Protestants, the Protestants who said, sola scriptura, scripture alone. And of course, the, the Roman Catholic tradition said it's scripture and tradition. And they'll say things like this, scripture was birthed out of the church. And that's true. Well, of course it's true, because who wrote the scriptures? Well, besides God, the church, Christians, believers. And it was this group that, in a sense, canonized for all eternity scripture. So they have a point when they say scripture came out of the church. But what we mean by sola scriptura is that scripture is our final authority when it comes to the things of God. It's not on an equal standing as tradition. Protestants have tradition. Every denomination has a tradition, okay? But most Protestant denominations don't look at their tradition as equal to Scripture. Some, it's a little closer than others, but, but for the most part, that's why it's sola scriptura. Okay, any other questions on canonicity? All right, interpretation and illumination, how can I understand the Bible? As I mentioned before, I like to use the term um, interpret it plainly. Think of it as just God speaking to you. So like any other book, you should have some kind of understanding of grammar because grammar is how we understand words. Uh, since it was written a number of years ago, we have to look at the historical context. And I like to suggest you think in terms of what was the author's intent. It's, to me, it's like any other book. When you pick up a book, you ask yourself, well, why did this author write this book? What was his purpose for writing it? Obviously, for a fiction book, it may just be for entertainment. It may just be to give a good story. But if it's a nonfiction book, usually the author has some kind of, they want to fill you with knowledge about this certain topic. Or they want to show you a new way to look at things. Or if it's a book on finances, here's a way to get your finances under control. So there's a purpose. And when, when you ask that question, all of a sudden the books of the Bible, instead of becoming just this conglomeration of verses together, you begin to see, okay, this is what Paul is doing as he's writing this, this letter. So you ask yourself, what was the intent of the author? Uh, we interpret uh, theologically 
Uh, we interpret contextually. In other words, we compare scripture with scripture. We recognize that scripture is a unity, and so we can, we can compare it with other parts of scripture. And then, of course, uh, from, what is it, 1 Corinthians 2, it says, only those who have the Spirit of God can know the things of God. So you need to be led by the Holy Spirit in order to be able to really understand it. So you have interpretation, you have um, illumination, how can I understand the Bible, and then there's application, how do I apply scripture to my life? The Bible is written to provoke a personal response in us. If we don't uh, allow that to happen, we misuse the Bible. James especially says, if you read the Bible and don't do anything that it says, you're like a person who looks at a mirror and you're Hair's all messed up, you got dirt on your face, and you walk away and you say, hey, I look pretty good. And, and that's what a lot of us do. We read scripture and we go, oh, that's nice, and thank you, Lord, for this word, and we go about our merry way. But, but the intent of scripture is to change our lives, to apply uh, scripture to our lives. So that's, uh, those, those are the main terms when we think of bibliology. So you have this little chart, you want to get that out? because this shows how all those things tie together. So this is titled, How God's Word Comes to Us. So it starts off with a thought in God's mind. Do you believe that God has thoughts? Okay, so, so when, when God wants to speak to us, he, it starts off with a thought in his mind. That thought in his mind he reveals to mankind. So there you see revelation. Remember, we talked about revelation. So God reveals it to mankind. We talked about different ways that God reveals himself. But when we talk about scripture, we're saying how God worked in the hearts and the minds of the authors that wrote down the books of the Bible. So a thought in God's mind is then revealed to the human author, which becomes a thought in the human author's mind. And then through inspiration, that is the guidance, remember 2 Peter, where it talks about the Holy Spirit moved along these authors to write scripture. They wrote down that thought which was in their mind, which was led to them by the Holy Spirit, that those became the original manuscripts of scripture. Do we have the original manuscripts of the Bible? Not yet. <laughs> I don't know if we ever will, but I'm not sure we ever will. And that's why, remember, we talked a little about inerrancy. Inerrancy is one of those things that some people say, well, inerrancy is only binding to the original manuscripts. We don't have the original manuscripts, so why do we even talk about it? Well, there, there's a point there, but the reality is, the question really is, is the Bible trustworthy? Can we trust what the Bible says? Can I, can I put my life on the Word of God? If I can't, then there's really no sense in reading it, studying it, and believing it, and all that kind of stuff. But if I feel that the Bible is trustworthy, then I'm going to believe it. I'm going to follow it. So anyway, through inspiration, you have the original manuscripts. All these manuscripts are written down, all these books of the Bible, all the letters. And then canonicity, we talked about that, the collection of 66 books into one. And then it's through textual criticism, which is studying Greek and Hebrew Bibles to get to as close to the original text as you can. Then you translate that into your modern versions, your modern languages. Here we have modern English versions. And then finally you come to read the English version of the Bible through interpretation and illumination. The Word of God becomes a thought in your mind as you read it. As it becomes a thought in your mind, you apply it in your own life. It changes your life. And as it changes your life, God says, hey, how about communicating it to other people? And so then you have communication. So that's how a thought in God's mind becomes a thought in somebody else's mind through you. So... I just thought that's a neat way to see how all these things tie together, and our time is up. Any questions about bibliology or about the Bible?
I know we just very briefly touched on things. There's probably a lot of things you could think about later. Write down your questions. We could talk about them. Go ahead. I have two questions. One, yeah. Um, right now, I, this, this one is the NIV, only because it's, it's a nice size that I carry. <laughs> uh, there, is, there is the perfect translation, though. Yeah. No, there is. The perfect translation is whichever one you're going to read <laughs> and listen to and feel like it's, it's touching your heart and your soul. Okay? What's that? Well, just, just shows where we pastors are in cahoots. Um, obviously, when we went through all this, you realize when you come down to an English translation, you're pretty far away from the original manuscripts, okay? So you, you can't ever really say there's an English translation that's the perfect translation. And here's the question to ask yourself. Just as God guided the original authors to write down the original manuscripts, do you think God has guided the process of getting his scriptures out to people in the world today? Now, I'm sure you can have your defenses of certain translations that you think are better than others, but, and this may sound really snobbish of me, but in a sense, until you know Greek and Hebrew, you're just going by what others have said or what you have gathered experientially as you've read scripture. Because if you don't know Greek and Hebrew, you don't have anything to compare it to. So that when you read it and you say, wow, I like that translation, and you, you may even do some studies and say, I think this is a better translation. But you're only going by what others have already done. See, so now, and just because you know Greek and Hebrew doesn't necessarily make you an expert in how that's translated, okay? So that, that takes me away from that snobbish, snobbish part. The point I'm making is most of our, uh, of, the, of our decisions of how we say one translation is better or we use one translation is purely subjective. And when I say that, I don't mean necessarily it's just totally just, just an idea you had. It's probably subjective in the sense, this is what you grew up with, this is what your church used, this is maybe what one of your youth pastors said, hey, this is the translation I like the best, or whatever. Or if you came out of a tradition that said, no, this is the only translation, maybe you're still believe that, or maybe you're starting to struggle with that. I don't know. So, um, but that, that's where I come from. I, I, uh, in my own personal Bible reading, I, I actually read from my phone. I read uh, from Version, which, of course, has all kinds of translations, and I use the New Living Translation for that. And I remember back, back in the day when the original Living New Testament, Living Bible that uh, uh, was written, it was actually a paraphrase. Um, a lot of people criticized it because it was a paraphrase. But now the New Living Translation is actually a translation that, that riffs off of the, the original Living Bible, uh, I, I find very good and refreshing. I, I enjoy reading the message only because it's so out there, kind of, okay? Now, if, if you want to get close to the Greek and the Hebrew, uh, use the New American Standard Version. But it's so... It's almost sometimes way too literal, verse by verse. And so it gets pretty wooden. You kind of go, what does that mean? So, like I said, find the translation that, that you feel comfortable with and, and that you'll read. And that's the perfect translation for you. Okay? And then you had a second question you said? Yeah. Uh, how many years have you been studying theology? Um, I'm 69, so... 66 years, <laughs> started three years old. No, I mean, I, I had an interest in the Bible and theology real early on in life. Um, I was in high school. It was my Sunday school teacher who was a, actually a student at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. And he took me through classes one day, and I said, this is where I want to go. Then I found out I had to go to college first. So I ended up going to Wheaton College. And so I went to Wheaton College and Dallas Seminary. 
and I graduated from there in 1980. I've been pastoring since 1980. Yeah. And I, I love studying the Word of God. Sometimes I love studying it more than I like teaching it, even. And I love teaching it, too. So. Okay, any other questions? Remember, if you have any questions uh, or you think about one, you know, in the middle of the night you wake up and you find, you, I think this is a question I need to ask Steve. Well, write it down and bring it to me, okay? Because I, I want to hear your questions. I want this to not just be something where I can say, okay, these are the subjects of theology. I want, I want to know what, what things are bothering you or what you have concerns about or maybe something you're wrestling with. And, you know, if you fear judgment or something, you know, write, write it down anonymously or something like that. And I, and I hope you don't feel that way because we, we try not to be that way. I don't know if you've heard much about people who are going through what they call deconstruction. And deconstruction is fine if you end up reconstructing something. Um, if you've ever watched these shows about how you build, you know, building homes and changing homes, they always have the, the demo, mm -hmm. okay? And of course, that's, that's the one they all, the guys always like because they could just go in there and bang everything. It's when they rebuild it, they have to be precise. Well, what's happening with a lot of these people, especially people who were either raised in Christian homes or have been Christians a long time, maybe even in ministry, but they're deconstructing. That's all I hear. They're deconstructing. They're not saying, you know, one of these days I'm going to reexamine all this. I'm going to come back. Or some of them don't even say, I'm, I, I haven't left Jesus. Some of them will say that. I've left Jesus. I've left all of Christianity, which to me is really sad. So you may be in that stage, which is fine. We all go through times in our life where we have to examine what we believe and why we believe. And hopefully this is a safe place to do that. Hopefully you are establishing relationships with one another where you can talk about those things. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's that. All right. Have a good dinner. We'll see you next week.